Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Mindscape podcast. I'm your host, Sean Carroll, and today we're going to be talking about heredity. This is, of course, a very old idea, the idea that there's something inside us, some properties, some features that get passed down through the generations. So we inherited something from our ancestors and we send something down to our descendants. Back in the day, there used to be the thought that royal blood was handed down, that the right to be the king or the queen or the emperor depended on who your parents were. I suppose there, <laughs> there's still countries in which that is the case. But we know a lot more about how heredity really works now than we used to. We know that all of our cells have a little molecule in them called DNA, and that DNA is a little code. It's a chain of letters, A, G, C, T, that the arrangement of those letters tells us what makes up who we are. Or at least there's a simplistic version of it where you think of DNA as kind of like a blueprint, that if you knew what the DNA was, you could predict exactly what the organism was going to be, maybe even, you know, what kind of food they would like or what kind of occupation they would have later in life. Today, we know it's a little bit more complicated than that. There's more going on than just our DNA to make up who we are, and not only nature versus nurture, but even the nature part is very complicated. There's epigenetics and development factors. There's mitochondrial DNA. There's the expression of different parts of the genes that we have. And so we're in a very, very rapid state of evolution, as it were, in terms of how we think about how heredity works. These days, you can get your genome sequenced. You can send it into a company, pay some money, and they'll tell you something about your genetic heritage. On the horizon, we see the ability to edit genes. We can do it in some ways now, and the ability to do that for human beings probably is not very far away. So it's natural to imagine, you know, can we design what the next generation of human beings is going to be like? Can we design the animals and plants that make up the rest of our ecosystem? These are important questions as well as fascinating ones. So we have uh, today Carl Zimmer as our guest. Carl is one of the very best science writers working out there. He's been working and writing about this area of genetics and heredity and DNA for a very long time. You may know Carl through his blogging or his Twitter account, his New York Times column, or you may have heard him on NPR. Now Carl has a major new book out called She Has Her Mother's Laugh, The Powers, Perversions, and Potential of Heredity. It's a doorstopper. It's a big one, uh, but it's full of fascinating individual human stories as well as the deep science behind what we know about heredity. So we're going to talk about how heredity works, what we do and don't know about it, and most importantly, where the new knowledge that we're gaining every day might take us. It seems very plausible that what we're learning these days might dramatically change how we think about being human beings. So let's go. <laughs> Carl Zimmer, welcome to the Mindscape Podcast. It's great to talk to you. So now we've known each other virtually, at least online, you know, since the early Halcyon Salad days of the blogging world, right? It, it didn't, uh, isn't that how I got to know you reading your blog and you read mine? Absolutely. Yeah. Back when blogs were the future. Blog, yes. <laughs> now we're in the future and no one writes blogs anymore. <laughs> <laughs> they, they delivered us here. Exactly. The future is a, is a journey, you know, that's, and we've, we've been through the future and now we're in the post future. So I, I couldn't help you. You've written this uh, gigantic magisterial book about heredity, inheritance. Uh, she has her mother's laugh and the subtitle, of course, the power, perversions and potential of heredity. And while reading it, I can't help but think as a physicist, you know, my goodness, how lucky I am that what I do for a living doesn't really matter to people's lives. Because this is a kind of science that everyone has feelings about, right? Do you, does that come through in your work? Oh, I, I think that uh, everybody uh, clings to heredity in a profound way. And, and I see that when I give talks about my book. I mean, I have learned to keep my prepared remarks fairly short because people just have tons of questions. And, and the questions come from the fact that we use heredity to define who we are and also what is our connection both to the past and to the future. I mean, you can't ask for anything more intimate than that. 
yeah, so the future in terms of our uh, children, our, our descendants, you mean? Sure, absolutely. And and also, like, what if we tamper with the heredity of other species? And, you know, then what right. what is what is left after we're gone? Well, you know, heredity will carry on those sorts of changes into the future. So I think, you know, everyone who is involved in this conversation right now uh, knows a little bit, right? You know, we're not entering and we're not telling people something that they've never heard before, that there's something called DNA in our, in our cells and it, it carries some information. So let's try to remember what it was like before we knew that, right? People still had an idea of inheritance and heredity and things being passed down through the blood even before Darwin and Mendel came along. Right. I mean, it's kind of hard to reconstruct the way people thought in the past, especially when they didn't use the concepts and the words that we use today. Uh, and yet, you know, we can we can start to get some clues about about it just by looking back and and trying to piece together. You know, for example, um, you know, there were ideas about blood, as you say. You know, we we some still use the word blood to to talk about you know mm -hmm. what we really mean by genes. You know, there's uh, the blue blood, for example. You know, like blue blood is something that is like, well, you come from a blue blood family. In other words, somehow like that is inherited down through the generations, um, your sort of status. I mean, the irony is, of course, that the phrase actually comes from a particular time in a particular place. It was in Spain in the 1500s when people in Spain were trying to uh, distinguish themselves from Jews and Muslims. <laughs> so, right. so the, this is where, and this is where the whole issue of race comes from. I mean, literally the word race starts to be used in Spain uh, in this way. Um, and so, you know, what are we I, talking? What, what, what century you said? 1500s, okay. uh, 1400s and into 1500s. A and um, uh, the, so the idea with blue blood was that if you were, you know, racially pure, then someone could see your veins through your translucent skin. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, you can kind of get these ideas about how in Western society, there were these ways in which we started to uh, define ourselves as, as being sort of made up of something that was being passed down through the generations. But, you know, it, uh, really, you know, in the, it wasn't until the 1800s that people like Charles Darwin actually like framed it as a scientific question. Like, okay, there's something, something molecular that is being passed down through the generations and explains why people have these traits that seem to run in families. So what is it? You know, so, so yeah, I mean Darwin wouldn't have said the word molecular, right? But I, but we know what you mean. There is something that is being given from parents to children. What did but without genes, without DNA or anything like that, um, with this basic idea that we inherit from our mothers and our fathers, did anyone ever wonder about the fact that why aren't we always just exactly halfway in between our mothers and our fathers in every trait? There there clearly seem to be variations around that. Do people? in pre uh, Mendel and DNA worry about this fact? Yeah, they, I mean, they could see for themselves that um, these patterns of heredity were not simple. They, they really puzzled over them. Mendel was just in a long line of people who are scratching their heads. Um, and, you know, these were plant breeders. These were animal breeders. Um, in the 1700s, uh, someone named Bakewell in England became legendary because he created a new uh, breed of sheep. Uh, and he did it by carefully breeding different kinds of sheep together uh, and, and coming up with these sort of rules of his own for how, how to breed them. Uh, and it was a, an incredible accomplishment, you know, because, you know, people would breed animals and, you know, like their offspring would be all sort of a mess. They would be like, right. you know, all this variation when, you know, if you're breeding animals, you all, you want them all to be the same. You know, if you want a particular kind of meat from an animal, you want them yeah. all to have that same taste. You want a kind of wool, you want the same wool. Um, so it was a huge puzzle and struggle and, and the stakes were enormous. I mean, you know, by the 1700s and 1800s, countries were actually looking at breeding, in other words, heredity as part of their national wealth. 
You know, if you could breed new crops and new livestock, you were going to make your country rich. I love the practicality of it. It, it reminds me of you know how thermodynamics which can be a very abstract and theoretical subject, arose from trying to get better steam engines, right? You know, this, this was definitely an era where there was a give and take between people with boots on the ground trying to make better products and trying to understand the world better as, as scientists. Yeah, it is interesting. I mean, because, you know, we assume that everybody must have thought about heredity the way we do and wondered about it the way we do. Um, 500 years ago or a thousand years ago, but they just didn't. Um, and <laughs> it, it wasn't really until the, some practical questions uh, drove people to really think carefully about this. Uh, and, you know, the other people, in addition to breeders, were psychiatrists. In the early 1800s, particularly in France and also to some extent in the United States and elsewhere, um, psychiatrists were trying to understand. Uh, madness. And then they were struck by the fact that when they would do questionnaires for their patients, their patients often had people in their family or more distant relatives who also were institutionalized or, you know, maybe they uh, had, you know, something that seemed like a form of madness. And so they said, hmm, so, so is this a hereditary disease? And, and if so, how on earth could this be passed down through the generations? And right. so Dar Darwin actually read a lot of psychiatry uh, when he was developing his own ideas about heredity. So this connection between heredity and intelligence and madness and thought was there from the very, very beginning. Yeah. Uh, a lot of the things that we're talking about right now uh, people were talking about 150 or 200 years ago with just as much um, loudness and passion and conflict. <laughs> Maybe not just as much because now we have Twitter and they didn't have that there. So that's an amplifier that they didn't have. Yeah, but they had pamphlets, you know, like pamphlets. they, uh, yeah, they, yeah the, a lot of this stuff would, would get circulated in things like pamphlets where, you know, you they, you get a new pamphlet every day. Like I, 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 I feel like Twitter is just an extension of the old traditions of pamphlets. So maybe blogging is the past more than the future. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I don't know where podcasting fits in, though. So then we did get to uh, genetics, right, to real genetics, to uh, Mendel. Mendel, by the way, I have to always say this. Uh, uh, I went to an Augustinian university, Villanova, and Augustinians have a slight inferiority complex compared to the Jesuits, who are you know, wonderfully intellectually, have this wonderful intellectual tradition. But we have two really important Augustinians in history. One was Gregor Mendel, and the other was uh, Martin Luther. So <laughs> they weren't always, you know, the, the best Catholics, but they, they, they did affect the world in an important way. So Mendel, uh, among other things, he helped sort of pinpoint this discreteness, right, of heredity, that there could be like, you get this feature or you don't. So there must be somehow, it wasn't just a blending of your two parents. There was some piece of information, a, a quantum, a physicist would call it, that's being handed down through the generations. Right. Uh, Mendel didn't call them genes. Um, sometimes the terms he used get translated as factors. So mm -hmm. there would be some kind of factor that was in a plant. And there was an almost mathematical um, beauty to how these factors combined in new offspring and then produced a trait. So just what, you know, an example that people may recall from high school is that uh, peas can be wrinkled or they can be smooth. Um, and if you cross two wrinkled pea plants together, they're, you're going to get nothing but wrinkled peas. If you cross two uh, smooth peas together, um, you might get nothing but smooth peas. And then the next generation after that, smooth peas and smooth peas forever. On the other hand, if you uh, cross a smooth pea and a smooth pea together, you might be surprised to suddenly have a quarter of the peas being wrinkled. Um, and um, and so the fact is that um, these that wrinkled factor can hide because it's what we would now call well actually Mendel called it too recessive. So um, yeah, so so that was the first uh, recognition that uh, that there was a sort of dis there was a sort of a thinking about heredity with these two kind of distinct parts 
the the invisible factors that get carried on through the generations and then sort of what you see uh the what, right. what scientists call the phenotype and then we started finally figuring it out we're moving quickly through the history here because i want to get to the modern world but uh it wasn't until the 20th century that we were able to identify these genes as being carried by this wonderful molecule the dna and uh watson and crick etc and by that time correct me if i'm wrong but there was already this new synthesis of um, genetics and evolutionary biology, natural selection, Darwin. And so the DNA was just sort of figuring out, not just, but it was figuring out what the mechanism of that was. Uh, yeah, well, that's a beautiful distillation of <laughs> like 80 <laughs> years of really rough science. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, people had known about DNA really since the 1800s, but they were kind of like, ah, what is this weird stuff? And um Sorry, and, just to make just to make that very clear. They knew that there was a molecule called DNA. Exactly. If you if you pulled apart cells, you uh, would find different components. So you'd find some molecules that are known as proteins that all had a similar chemical composition, and then you would find this stuff that they called nucleic acid, and uh, and people just didn't really know what it was for. You know, and right. and. Actually, you know, even in the mid 1900s, a lot of people thought proteins were what genes were made of, um, and yeah. it, it took some elegant experiments to um, to demonstrate. No, actually, it's really if you transfer DNA from one microbe to another, you transfer that trait. Uh, the proteins don't matter, and and uh, so then once we figured out the structure of DNA, uh, then all of a sudden we can get down to the molecular details of how genes uh, make heredity possible. In other words, that it's almost like genes are like texts, you know, they're, right. they're made up of these units that, that where they're like letters made up from a four letter alphabet. And we have, you know, over 3 billion letters in our, in our DNA and change the letters um, or cut and paste chunks of text and uh, you get changes to to us and and those changes can be passed down if the dna is being faithfully copied right and so 3 billion 3 billion base pairs right in our in the human uh, dna and but we talk about only having like 20,000 genes so I, I, I'm going to ask every biologist I ever talked to on the podcast to explain this because it took me a long while to get it right. Yeah. But explain uh, the relationship between the base pairs and the DNA and what we call genes. Yeah, it, it's it's kind of messy, <laughs> but, you know, biology is messy. Yeah. So um, so so the 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 way that people traditionally think about genes is a stretch of DNA that encodes a protein. Um, and, uh, so, you know, every, every protein is, is encoded by a, a gene. Uh, it is true. Although sometimes you get proteins that are made by combining genes together and all sorts of stuff we don't need to get into. But in any case, um, uh, we have, as you say, 20,000 of these protein coding genes, um, and they only make up about 1% or so, one or uh, one or two percent of the of our of the human genome. So then the big question is, well, what's all the other stuff? Yes, and yeah. <laughs> so so some of it, um, you know, maybe ten percent of it uh, is has functions of its own. So actually, some of them are also genes. It's just that they don't go the full process towards uh, making proteins. Um, you have thousands of genes, we don't know how many, that actually uh, encode RNA molecules. Okay. So you, you may be used to thinking of RNA as part of the process to make protein. You got right. a gene so made a RNA, DNA. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. You got a gene made of DNA. You make a copy in RNA, which is a single stranded version of DNA, basically. And then you use that RNA as a template for building proteins out of a different set of molecules. Right. amino acids. And that's, that's true. Um, but it turns out that sometimes our cells will make an RNA molecule and then that's it. Um, and that not only that's it, but that RNA molecule 
has a really important job to do. So for, for example, in, in women, women have two X chromosomes. They need to keep one of them shut off or they're going to basically uh, poison themselves with too many proteins from the X chromosome. Men only have one X chromosome. So there are, uh, so there are these RNA molecules that basically wrap around the, uh, the X chromosome, one of the X chromosomes in women and silence it. Um, and so, you know, we know that at least some of these RNA molecules play an important job. So that's, those are more genes, but that still leaves you with a lot of the rest of the genome. So some of that DNA is really important as kind of genetic switches for turning on and off, um, genes uh elsewhere in the genome mm-hmm. uh and then the rest you know a lot of it is probably what scientists would scientifically call junk <laughs> there a lot of them are dead genes they're genes that have mutated and just are useless now and we just carry them along uh some of them are actually descend from viruses so viruses infect our dna and make copies of themselves that get passed down um, and uh, just spread all over our genome and and, uh, bulk it up with all sorts of stuff that we don't actually use. Um, So it's- uh, They also could be codes that were injected by aliens millions of years ago to be activated at some point in the future, right? Yeah, right. Now, I haven't seen Mm. the papers on that yet, but uh, maybe you've seen a preprint. I'm giving giving you (laughs) jewels here, Carl. You should write the paper. (laughs) All right. I'm going to get on. I'm going to have the scoop of the century. But it's a good reminder that, you know, we're not intelligently designed. The cell is kind of a mess that has been put together over billions of years. And DNA doesn't care that its job is to encode genes into proteins. It does whatever it wants to do, so or whatever it needs to do to make things function. So some of the DNA is making proteins. Some of it's making RNA that will do something. Some of it's just going along for the ride because it keeps getting copied all the time, right? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to believe, but the cell is a lot sloppier than we think of it as being. You know, a lot, a lot of, uh, of DNA um, actually is used by our cells to produce RNA molecules. And then the cell just immediately shreds all that RNA because th- it, those were just sort of accidental. Um, right. They were just not, they didn't really have any function. So um, you can have junk DNA shooting off RNA molecules, but like they don't serve any purpose. So they just, you know, the, the, fa- the cell just sort of like manages this chaos, you know, by having certain proteins that kind of go around and say like, are you, are you supposed to be here? And, you know, <laughs> If not, then they just shred them and and just recycle it to to make more RNA molecules. So um, yeah, it's not it's uh, it's and if if you really get to know cells, intelligent design becomes kind of laughable. And so okay, so we have this idea that the coding parts there there are parts of the DNA stretches of DNA, uh, many many base pairs at once that will code into a protein. There's probably a an informal and incorrect idea. I'm sure none of our extremely sophisticated and well-educated Mindscape listeners would have this idea, but some people might think that there's a direct map from a gene to a trait to, you know, how big our nose are, what color our hair is, or how, you know, charismatic we are. Uh, but it's more complicated than that, right? For the most part, yeah, it is more, more complicated. I mean, you know, we it's good to learn about Mendel in, in high school, but, you know, I, I do think that it's going to be important for schools to take students beyond Mendel now that people are getting their DNA tested by companies like 23andMe. Um, You can't really understand those test results if you're just relying on pea plant experiments. Right. You know, there, I mean, we, you know, your blood type, sure. It's like, you know, there's one gene and, and there are different versions of the gene and that, that can determine your blood type. Okay. No problem. But, um, but for most of the traits that we actually really, care about or are, think about, um, and even sim- seemingly simple ones like height, um, th- they are influenced by many, 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 many different genes. Uh, and uh, so that, um, yeah, you can't say that, oh, I have, do, do I have the tall gene? Right. It's just meaningless. 
But so we brought ourselves up to about, as you as you infer, uh, imply the level of high school biology. You know what people sort of remember. Uh, we have a DNA, we pass it along. And I think that, you know, even if there's some complicated nonlinear map from the genes in our DNA to our traits, people still have this idea that basically there's a molecule, the DNA, and from the molecule, that's us. That just makes us, right? But we know a lot more than that now also, right? I mean, there's various ways in which the thing that we turn into is more than just what's encoded in our DNA in any straightforward way. Is that an accurate statement? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, and, and you know, when we, I mean, I, I it's funny, you know, like uh, if, if you say to someone, um, oh, you have two eyes, you must have gotten your two eyes from your parents. <laughs> They're going to look at you funny, like, what? That doesn't make sense. You know, and the fact is that you do get, you did get your two eyes from your parents. But when we, when we talk about, oh, you got this, you got that from your parents, we're really more interested in the things that are different between people so that we can say like, oh, you are tall and your great uncle Bertie was tall. So you must have gotten it from him, even though, of course, Bertie is off to the side, whatever. (laughs) My point being, my point being that, um, that, uh, we 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 uh, just get kind of confused about um, what it is that we're talking about when we when we talk about these these traits, and the fact is that you know you might be tall like your uncle Bertie is tall, um, sure partly because of of the genes you inherit, but um, you know maybe you and your uncle Bertie also had the privilege of growing up in a um, a, a affluent society, an affluent family, you had good diets, you got medicine when you were a kid, and so that you had the opportunity to grow to be tall. Um, Because the fact is that, you know, all over the world, the average height of people is several inches higher than it was a century ago. And that's not because we are now inheriting a different set of genes. It's just that in that, in that respect, the world got to be a, a better place, um, and so, so you have to sort of take into account the uh, the, the combined influences of uh, genes and environment, or actually, as Shakespeare once called it, nature and nurture. <laughs> we will, we'll get there, but I think that even at the level of nature, even at the level of our inheritance, uh, our genetic inheritance, uh, I. I you know, I'm learning about from your book, among other places, how complicated that is. For example, the idea of mitochondrial DNA, right? We have these little sort of genetic stowaways in every single one of our cells and we hand them down to subsequent generations. That's right. That's right. So, yeah, even if you just limit yourself to genes, um, heredity can be a lot more complicated and strange than we learned about. So, mitochondria we have dozens or hundreds of them in every cell and we depend on them for our survival they're the little factories that generate fuel for our cell uh you know using uh oxygen and and various nutrients to to build to build fuel that we then burn uh, they do lots of other stuff too so the uh, power house great. of the cell yeah absolutely um and um the weird thing about them, well, several weird things. One is that they've got their own DNA in them. Um, that's that's aside from the DNA that's tucked away in the nucleus. So they've all got their own DNA. And if you look at a cell, you can actually watch mitochondria divide on their own. And they make new copies of their own DNA for those new daughter cells. And you might say like, whoa, that doesn't make sense. That sounds like bacteria. And it's like, yeah, yeah. guess what? They're bacteria. <laughs> Exactly. Like about 1.8 billion years ago, when we were single celled, the ancestors of mitochondria somehow ended up inside of our cells and some maybe some kind of symbiotic relationship, kind of like, you know, cleaner fish that go inside the mouths of bigger fish. And um, and then they became basically permanent residents so that they couldn't live outside of our cells anymore. and as, as if that wasn't weird enough, um, you know, when a, when a sperm approaches an egg, it's, it's swimming furiously and it's using that mitochondria to generate that fuel to swim. 
Um, so the only way I can get to an egg is to use this mitochondria and then it reaches the egg and it dumps in its chromosomes, mm -hmm. but then it also destroys its own mitochondria. It just rips them apart. So both so, the sperm and the egg have separate mitochondria from dad and mom. Right. And the sperm do not deliver their mitochondria into the egg. Lazy bastards. <laughs> well, it, it, it's puzzling because, you know, we are, when you look at our chromosomes, we are a 50-50 split between um, our parents. But you look at our mitochondria, it's all mom. It's just all mom. So mitochondrial and, inheritance is not sexual reproduction. Uh, exactly. Exactly. It, you know, back to, uh, it, it, for some reason we, we keep out, uh, one of the parents from that process. Um, and it's interesting because what that means is that, you know, your mitochondria, um, is, is extremely similar to your mother's and your grandmother's and so on and so on and so on. Because, you know, for, with your chromosomes in every generation, the pairs of chromosomes, they shuffle some of their DNA together. Right. And so they swap pieces in, in this process called meiosis. Um, and so um, so after several generations, you know, your, your, you know, chromosome number two doesn't really look all that much like your great, 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 great grandmother's chromosome two. Um, but, uh, but mitochondria, basically the same. I mean, and, and so you, they're really powerful for tracing genealogy, for example. Um, you know, you could, the, the, uh, um, you can say like, aha, well, this person has to be the child of this woman. I mean, there's just right. no two ways about it. Uh, and, and yeah, it's a, it's a, you know, sci scientists who are just looking at the basic questions about heredity are like, why, why, why is this? Why, why, <laughs> why would the sperm not give the mitochondria? What, why is it only the mothers? And, um, you know, there are some interesting theories about it. I mean, one theory is that um, if you have two batches of mitochondria inside a person coming from different people, yeah. um, they're going to not play well together, um, that, that they're going to operate differently, and that could actually cause problems. I mean, that uh, makes sense, some... right? When, we, when, mm -hmm. we, when meiosis happens, meiosis is the splitting of this cell into a little sexual reproduction cell, right? So, you know, we split our genome in half, and then they're going to recombine with the half from the other parent, and the mitochondria kind of aren't participating in that process. So it's, you know, dad's mitochondria and mom's are just there separately, and they, they might come into conflict, like you say. Right, right. I, I, and, you know, the, there are, um, there are, there are, um, it's interesting, you know, there are, we, we think of sort of mom and dad's genes as, as, you know, playing nicely in our own genome, but you know there are there are conflicts between the genes in our parents and evolutionary conflicts. Um, Sometimes and, there's conflicts between our actual parents too. <laughs> yeah, and now think about it inside our DNA. You know, um, you know sometimes uh, uh, there'll be like you know dad's genes are maybe sort of driving kids to grow faster because that's uh, good for the father's long term evolutionary benefit. The mother, meanwhile, if the if the mother is, is has to carry, you know, the children, like yeah. has to be pregnant, like too much growth is actually like can really drain her resources and may mean that she has fewer children over her lifetime. And so you will actually find that a, the man's copy of a gene is turned on, a woman's copy is turned off inside the child. It's so it's like this tug of war going on. <laughs> Um, sure. Just to try, just to try to, uh, that finds the sort of optimal thing. Um, and then sometimes you actually find, um, there are, there are genes or pieces of DNA that basically just totally break Mendel's law completely and just, uh, sort of override that sort of 50, 50 kind of split between which chromosome ends up, you know, in, in an egg or a sperm, um, this was illustrated with a discovery once of, of certain kinds of flies, certain strains of flies that where they would almost all, always produce daughters. 
Mm -hmm. And scientists are like, what's going on here? And it turned out that there was a gene that was basically hijacked. It was sitting on the, you know, uh, on the female chromosome in, uh, in, in flies and was sort of basically um, ensuring that these flies did not have any sons because if they, if they were just daughters, I would spread this gene further. Sort of the ultimate selfish gene. <laughs> well, this makes sense, right? I mean, we, I mean, maybe it makes sense. Maybe I'm, I'm leaping ahead too far, but we have this kind of game theoretic way of thinking about not just the struggle to survive as organisms, but we, we can, in the selfish gene way of thinking, uh, think of it as the individual genomes trying to pass themselves down. And, you know, mom has a genetic uh, set of information and so does dad, and they both want to win. And in human beings and mammals, there's this rough equilibrium that we've reached where uh, children are 50-50 male and female, but that's certainly not universal across the animal kingdom. There's a sort of different equilibria you could might imagine reaching where the struggle plays out in different ways. Sure. And, and actually, there are some animals that adjust the ratio of their offspring just depending on what their environment kind of looks like. Right. So there, there are birds that, you know, in effect, what they're doing is looking around and saying like, I think I need a lot of daughters to stick around and to help me raise, you know, my other chicks. And voila, incredibly, they produce a, a more daughters and sons. And then there are other situations where they produce more sons than daughters, you know, and then the sons fly off. Um, uh, so yeah, I mean, it's, um, we, we, you know, we, we, we like to think about, um, we like to take biology and put it into categories and, and try to come up with absolutes. So, you know, Mendel's observations become Mendel's law, yeah. um, or, or males and females become these sort of absolute categories that, you know, you could never have any exception to, uh, I mean, we we keep doing that. I think we just have very, you know, brains that really like categories, but, you know, heredity just does not work <laughs> like that. Yeah. And, and, you know, yeah, there are some patterns that kind of repeat themselves a lot, but um, a lot of times those patterns are the sort of, the sort of a stable balance produced by competition um, that sort of works out into this, this almost like a detente. Well, I talked with Alice Dreger in episode three of the podcast, and we talked about intersexuality and how the fact that the idea there's two sexes, right, that's a convenient fiction. It's, it's very useful. It's a good approximation. But if you're going to try to be a little bit more careful, there's a whole bunch of stuff in between and different ways you can be in between. And, and this reflects, I, I think that philosophically, this is just a really important point that you're bringing up, that we organize the world, we human beings, for our comprehension because it's easy for us but as we try to be more and more accurate, all those complications are going to become more and more relevant to a better understanding. Yeah. And, and I noticed that a lot of times people will justify these absolute categories by saying like, well, look, like this is just nature. You know, this is this is yeah. biology. You have to just accept biology. And I'm like, whoa, like you want to <laughs> talk about biology? Let's take a little tour, shall we? And, and through my 600 page book on inheritance. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, the fact is that heredity itself works very differently in, in, a, in a lot of different orga organisms. And, you know, the, the irony is that like this is this is one reason why Mendel was forgotten. Hmm. Actually, so this is this this one of these these incredible ironies is that Mendel studied peas and he and he was like, oh my gosh, look at this mathematical thing that's happening. Uh, and he wrote to one of his mentors, and his mentor was like, uh, hmm, I that's interesting. I'm not sure what to make <laughs> of this, but why don't you see if you can replicate this? You know, like if. If this is what you say it is, then you ought to be able to find it in another plant, right? So Mendel, I guess, agreed with that. And he went and studied another common garden plant. Uh, um, um, and it turned out that this this other one, um, hawkweed, I think, I forget the name now, uh, it, it doesn't reproduce in the neat sort of sexual way that peas do. Um, it has pollen. You know, pollen is sort of like the plant equivalent of sperm, and so they have mm -hmm. male and female uh, uh, gametes, and and they have you have to have fertilization. But in these other plants, um, 
once fertilization happens, uh, the the ovules, the the eggs, as it were, just basically just kick out <laughs> any male DNA. They don't uh-huh. use it, so um, they they do meiosis, you know, it, within their own <laughs> genes. Uh, and so, base they're they're kind of like clones, except that they're sort of shuffling their DNA with every generation. So you know, like. Boom! Like those lovely three to one patterns that Mendel saw with peas, they're just not there at all right. when he looks at another species. And then it's like, huh? And um, you know, you imagine if he had picked another species that was very neat about, uh, very you know, worked like peas did, that he might have gained more traction. Um, but no, I mean, he he was he was forgotten for basically fifty years. It's good to know that the deflationary role of mentors has not changed in academia uh, over, yeah. over the centuries. That's I think I've done that to my students sometimes. <laughs> I, so I love the idea that our mitochondria, as important as they are, these stowaways. That, I mean, they're basically living their own lives, right? They're handing down their own uh, genetic inheritance, and it's part of what makes us who we are, and so forth. Uh, are there other examples of that? I mean, I know that we carry around a whole microbiome, a whole set of little monocellular organisms that uh, function in us. But my impression is that we kind of build those up throughout our lives. We don't actually get those from mom and dad. Well, you know, that is a, a big question right now. Uh, and, and, you know, there are people who are trying to really nail that down at the moment. Um, because, uh, you know, it is true that um, you pick up microbes every day. Um, you're picking them up off your keyboard and your doorknob and you're shaking hands or, you know, you're having yogurt. I mean, like we're just, yeah, we're, a, we're just swimming through a microbial ocean. And by you, you don't mean me in particular. You mean all of the listeners out. It's not my keyboard that is worse than average, right? Well, I've heard things. <laughs> um, no. So, um, so, so the, the thing is that, um, uh, we, we also know that there are lots of species that pass down certain microbes as faithfully as they do their own genes. Um, and my favorite example is cockroaches. Okay. So, so you know, cockroaches actually depend on uh, one species of bacteria to help them to eat food because the bacteria can actually make some of the compounds they need for proteins out of their food. The, the cockroaches don't have the genes to do it. So they totally depend on these bacteria. And in fact, they actually build special little organs uh, for these bacteria to live in. And the bacteria actually like embedded inside the cockroach's own cells in this organ. Uh, and when it comes time for the female to produce her eggs, something incredible happens. Some of these cells that are carry these microbes, they just start crawling and they make their way through the cockroach's body to the cockroach's eggs. And then they open up and they basically deliver these bacteria into the eggs. And so after these eggs get fertilized by a male cockroach, then the cockroach is born with these bacteria ready to go, um, just like we are with our mitochondria. Biology is very scary. <laughs> <laughs> It's mind blowing, and there, you know, I, I real, you know, the 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 best book on all of this is uh, Ed Young's book. Uh, I contain multitudes. Yeah. Um, for me, what interests me in particular about this is to think about this as another form of heredity, another channel of heredity. It's like you've got your own genes, quote unquote, but then you have these bacteria. Yeah. Now we don't have anything quite like that, except for mitochondria that we know that of. We know of, but right. But maybe there is something um, like heredity in the way that some of our bacteria end up inside of us. Um, you know, s- scientists are trying to figure out, for example, are human embryos sterile uh, when they're in the uterus? Like that, it, it, the, the evidence is not clear. Hmm. Um, what is clear is that as, as a baby moves through the birth canal dur- during uh, delivery, it gets slathered in bacteria. And uh, some of that bacteria goes into its gut, and and um, and there are certain forms of bacteria that the mother encourages to grow in the birth canal, and not only that, but um, but the mother's milk contains bacteria as well 
uh, as well as bacteria food. In other words, sugars that in the milk that babies can't digest themselves, but bacteria can. So, um, so there is a debate right now whether there might be um, you know certain species that are, are are being put into babies early on and, and sort of are kind of define our own species that way. It's a very so, romantic picture you are painting. The the miracle of childbirth <laughs> is <laughs> so enhanced by our scientific understanding. It's really great. Well, but it and it raises some very um, practical medical questions. You know, sure. cesarean sections are are exploding in countries like the United States, and so you know, you so those babies are not getting that exposure, uh, and so there's a question of like, well, does that matter? Um, yeah. do, you know, uh, can you still pick up those species just by being handled by your parents and other people, or huh. or does that not getting that seeding uh, at the beginning, is that a, is that a problem? Um, because, you know, if your microbiome isn't quite right when you're young, that can lead to problems throughout your life. You know, your immune system may not work properly, for example. Is it still thought to be true that the number of unicellular organisms in our microbiome is more cells than human cells in our body? Actually, no. <laughs> I, I, I heard rumors that that had gone away, that, that thought. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, and I, I and other people had, uh, when we'd write about the microbiome, we'd always say like, you, you know, your microbes outnumber your own cells by 10 to 1, which, you know, it's always fun to say. It is. Um, it turns out probably not to be true. Um, it, 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 it's just, it's probably more, cl- uh, more like 1 to 1. Okay. So we have about 37 trillion cells. Uh, of our own or quote unquote own human cells. Mm -hmm. Uh, It might be around the same, you know, I don't know, 30, 40 million bacteria. Um, You know, I don't, I don't, that doesn't count the viruses and the fungi and all the other fun critters that are (laughs) living inside of us. So, um, you know, the final number of the full microbiome might be higher, but it's not a 10 to one thing anymore. But a, but a body, a biological body is a, a complicated open system. It's a, it's a ecosystem all by itself. It's a, we're a little bus that is carrying around, a, you know, a whole world of little critters talking to each other and evolving and doing their own things. Yes, but it's not a totally random collection of critters. Right. Um, you know, like the same species and the same strains tend to turn up again and again in people. And I mean, my, your microbiome is going to be different than mine, but um, but not too differently, you know. And so you can, like, if you look at human microbiomes compared to like a chimpanzee's, um, they're, they're, they're going to be a lot more similar to each other than chimpanzees are. And it seems like there are, we have filters. Right. You know, so not everybody gets a seat in the bus. And then there's also um, the idea that we're learning more and more that just the information in our DNA, even just getting back to the the sort of genetic part of inheritance, uh, there's more to it. There's more to how we pass information down. There's the whole story of epigenetics and so forth. Uh, I, I hear that you're advocating that people take epigenetic yoga classes so they can pass down <laughs> new things that they learn to their uh, children. Is that right? Many people are saying that. Right. No, I'm. <laughs> <laughs> I hear people I, saying I, it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. No, I think you should. You should. Uh, you know, take epigenetic yoga if you like it, but don't think that your kids are going to be better for it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but the idea so, is so the, that we can learn yeah. something and pass it down, right? Yeah, that we could have an experience that alters how our genes work, and that alteration can get passed down to future generations. That's that's the crux of of epigenetics and heredity. Um, you know, and, and it's, it's, it's tricky. And I, I explore it in, in my book and, and, you know, it's, it's, um, there's definitely, um, good evidence for it happening in plants. It's good evidence for it happening in little teeny tiny worms. Mm-hmm. Um, when you get to mice, there's, there's some very tantalizing experiments. I mean, so for example, uh, there was one experiment where, uh, Scientists would would expose male mice to a, a certain odor and then give them a shock, and then they learned to to associate the odor with the shock. 
and then they took sperm from the mice and used it in in vitro fertilization and then produced mouse pups. And it seems like the mice in the next generation kind of responded oddly to that same odor. Uh, and, And so the claim was that somehow that learned memory, that learned association about that smell got passed down to the mouse pups. Um, you know, and when that paper came out, uh, the journal put Lamarck on the cover. <laughs> <laughs> Remind us who Lamarck is, Mr. Lamarck. Mr. Lamarck. Uh, so, right. So, so uh, Lamarck was a French biologist who preceded Darwin. Uh, he was uh, most active in the early 1800s uh, and came up with his own theory of evolution, which uh, depended um, a lot on what's known as um, uh, the inheritance of acquired traits. Um, and so um, so he had a classic example that, you know, uh, giraffes uh, stretch their neck to reach leaves. There's some sort of nervous fluid that uh, causes their, their necks to get a little bit longer. You can think about it, that like, like building up muscles. And then, um, and then the, then those giraffes would pass down that longer neck to their descendants. And so then over many generations, the giraffes would adapt to their environment by getting a longer neck. Um, and so, you know, the claim, I guess, is that, well, mice, you know, are adapting to their environment um, by learning about, you know, the risks that they face and that, that their offspring are inheriting that knowledge. Right. Um, so that's the basic idea. And how um, would this work sort of at the molecular level for the mice? Is it pups? You call them mice pups? Mice babies or puppies? Pups. Okay. They're pups. I learned something. Yeah. Uh, uh, so it's a matter of obviously the DNA are not being altered. As you as you smell something, your DNA is still your DNA. But somehow there's information being passed down to the next generation that is not in the DNA. It's somehow in the chemical um, makeup of, of uh, what goes into making a little puppy. <laughs> um yeah yeah um i, I don't think i don't uh, if you call if you call them mouse puppies at, at a biology conference people will probably look at you funny you think that people but, will see uh, through me and not, not realize i'm not yeah. a biologist <laughs> there's an imposter in our ranks uh, as a cosmologist get him know, out yeah uh no so um so so the uh the we know we know that that genes are attended to by lots of molecules in the cell, you know, genes just don't take care of themselves. Right. Um, and so, um, there are proteins, for example, that will clamp on to genes and they can essentially shut them down. There are, um, other places that proteins latch on to uh, DNA and they can switch on a gene. Um, you can coil DNA around spools and then basically anything that gets coiled up, any gene just can't be used to make a protein because it's just all tucked away. Uh, and so, uh, and those changes can be very long lasting. Like when a cell divides, those same controls will in, in effect be inherited by the two new cells. So that's why your skin cells, when they divide, they make skin cells. They don't, you know, make brain cells or, or tooth cells cells or something, you know, like it, so, so we know that epigenetics really matters a lot. There's no question about that. And so the question is, could these kinds of processes, you know, uh, change the way that genes are being used? And then could those changes, you know, those proteins and those coils or whatever get passed down through the generations? Um, we don't know. Yeah. We don't um, know. we, the, the mechanism for it, it's, I mean, is it's it's especially for mammals it's it's kind of hard to figure out how the mechanism would actually work uh and you look at a mouse experiment i mean all the critics of, of this kind of research have said like whoa so you're telling me that there's this change that that is happening in the mouse's brain the daddy mouse's brain <laughs> and and that somehow then that is getting communicated into daddy mouse's sperm and then somehow that is then making its way through fertilization, through the development of an embryo, through the development of a brain, and then somehow it's getting plugged into back into the brain in the same circuits that daddy had 
being altered. Uh, and a lot of scientists just say like, whoa, that, that doesn't make any sense at all. Right. But this is something that's being studied. We'll try to figure it out. Yeah, but in the meantime, there's epigenetic yoga. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, there are literally like psychiatrists who will will help you to undo the epigenetic trauma of, of you, that your grandparents passed down to you. Like, this has totally saturated pop culture, and I I don't honestly know how it happened because you know epigenetics is messy and complicated, and and the language is totally inscrutable, uh, and yet you know when I give talks, like half the questions I get after after the talks are. What about epigenetics? Um, Look, I'm writing a book and, about quantum mechanics, so the idea that crazy abstract ideas are going to be hijacked <laughs> by popular culture is not foreign to me. <laughs> any any tips? <laughs> well, quantum epigenetic yoga might be a, a bestseller, right? Oh there you my go. god! Right? With, That's throw, it. throw dark That's energy it. in there, and we'll be buying yachts uh, any any moment. So okay, we need to we need to tra- we need to patent that idea right now. Okay. Co- author author the book this week. I will edit this out of the podcast it. so no one hears it and steals our great idea. <laughs> it sounds like though, um, even in principle, if you handed uh, a computer a complete list of the six billion three billion base pairs in our DNA, the G C T A uh, letters in our alphabet, uh, a computer with perfect knowledge, that would not be enough to predict what the organism would look like. I mean, it would be missing the mitochondrial DNA. It would be missing all sorts of chemical signals that could be passed down through the body. But I mean, so we're, it sounds like we're learning how much of the organism is predicted by that. Probably a lot, right? But uh, certainly not the whole thing. Yeah. And, and in a way, this, this is one of those deep questions in the history of biology. Um, you know, how much of, of an organism is basically um, determined at the very beginning and how much of an organism's end result is just the emergence through development, you know, through, and, and, and you know, it's, you know, as always, the answer is both, but it's complicated, you yeah. know, in the, in the sense that you, there are a lot of things that you can predict based on DNA. Um, those predictions may are not like, you know, I can't like predict what color shoes you're wearing right now today uh, based on your DNA, Sean. But I bet if I looked at your DNA, I could get a pretty good idea what your eye color is. Mm. Um and I might be able to, um, you know, make make some very crude uh, predictions about the influence of your genes on on your height. Um, uh, I couldn't tell you how tall you are because I don't know if your parents, uh, you know, fed you properly. Um, right. <laughs> but you know, I, there 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 are things that you can predict out of uh, out of DNA. But then there's this, you know, the the DNA makes you know, the cells make proteins and RNA molecules from the genes and the cells are talking to each other and, and they're taking in cues from the environment. Cells are migrating through the body and all sorts of, all sorts of crazy stuff is happening. And, and all, the genes are responding to all of that. Uh, uh, and that is how we end up the way we are. So, yeah. So, you know, if someone, you know, I had my genome sequence, I'm sure nobody could make any predictions about me um from that yeah right i do want to that's right i remember this from the book so when you say you had your genome sequenced so like you're special here because you really had (laughs) the full-blown uh treatment if people do ancestry.com or 23andme or any of these things they get a little bit of information about their genome but they do not get a list of three billion uh acgts right i mean they get some some sub knowledge of that. Did do you actually have a printout of you know all three billion base pairs in your DNA? I do not have a printout. I have a hard drive. <laughs> okay, metaphorical. Yeah. I was being metaphorical. Yeah. Well, well, if I printed it out, it would you know fill up you know dozens and dozens of books. I mean, that would be a fun art project. But um, you can use a small font. It's okay. Yeah. Right. And it would be kind of hard to, you know, do a search function That's on true. that. <laughs> so I prefer prefer to have it on, on that hard drive because then I can take it to scientists and say like, okay, you know, let's let's play around with this data here, which just so happens to be my genome. And uh, show me how you discover things in human genomes um, by analyzing this sort of data. And it's been a fascinating experience, but 
it, it is a very different thing than getting your DNA sequence from a place like 23andMe. Um, what 23andMe or Ancestry does is they do something called genotyping. So basically, they look at maybe let's uh, maybe a million markers, a million spots in, in throughout your genome, and they try to uh, they look at see well which variant do you have at that particular spot, um, and so it's you know <clears throat> it's kind of a high level survey of your genome, but you can learn an awful lot. Um, one of the reasons you can learn an awful lot is because we we pass we tend to like share similar stretches of DNA. So, so if you've got, you know, a string of variants all in a row, chances are that that whole segment of DNA is identical to somebody else that has those same variants. Right. And so you can kind of, you can infer a lot about what's in between those markers. Um, when you get your whole genome sequence, that means that you're trying to figure out as best as you can, every single letter in your genome. Um, and, and that with that, you can discover all sorts of deeper things about your genome. Well, and one of the deeper things you could discover is that you are susceptible or even almost inevitably going to have some disease that might, uh, affect you at a certain time of your life. And so there's this question of what do we want to know? Like if, if you could, the, the philosophers would come in and instantly say the, the version of the question to ask is if you could know you were going to die on exactly a certain day, would you want to know that? Is that information you want? Some much cruder version of that might be available through this, uh, looking at our genomes. Uh, that information is really only available to, uh, a small fraction of the people who get their DNA genotyped or get their genome sequenced um, because um, the, the, the genes that really um, have a strong impact on your health, uh, you know, let's say, you know, we're talking about genes that cause Huntington's disease or genes that raise your risk dramatically of getting uh, early onset Alzheimer's, genes that dramatically raise your risk of getting certain forms of cancer, these are rare. Right. Um, you know, natural selection is not fond of these genes. <laughs> <laughs> For obvious so, reasons. So the, therefore they're rare. And, and, uh, and so, um, you know, I, I, when I, um, got my genome sequenced, the first part of it was, was doing it at, I, I did it at, as part of a conference. And I think there were like 40 people who were going to this conference who also got their genome sequenced. Um, they weren't getting the raw data, but they were getting these interpretations from clinical geneticists. And there were like 40 of us. And um, I th if I recall correctly, maybe like five people were told like, okay, you know, we're going to sit down with a genetics counselor and make some plans for you to talk to your doctor because there's something you need to know about. How's your life insurance plan looking? <laughs> yeah, right, right. I mean, for the rest of us, it was like, man, you know, uh, yeah, you know like you don't <laughs> well, have anything that scary. really, you don't have anything that really jumps out, you know, is, is, is what they would say. You know, there's nothing where it's like, hey, that gene, that's big trouble. Now, you know, I have plenty of genes that have been associated with, you know, raising my risk of this disease or that by some modest amount. But that doesn't mean that I'm going to die of any of those diseases. I mean, I also have variants that lower the risk for certain diseases too. And, right. and so, um, so, you know, it, and that's, you know, that is going to be how most people are going to uh, find what that's most people are going to find when they, when they get their DNA sequenced. And it's going to be, um, it, Either, you know, there a lot. I, I'm concerned that people not make one of two mistakes. One mistake is to be like sort of angry and irritated that they didn't find anything in their genome. You know, it's like really like <laughs> <laughs> my genome is much more interesting than you're making it out to be. Yes. Well, you know, like like this isn't like a status thing. Like it's not like you want to go to the doctor's office and and get terrible news, you know, and like, it's not like you feel like you're, you should feel happy if you, if they say, Oh, you're fine. Yeah. See you later. Um, and also, um, 
the flip side of that is that sometimes people will will get in these uh, reports or maybe do their own research and discover they have a gene that is associated with some disease that, you know, let's just say like colon cancer. Um, and they say, oh my God, that's it. I'm going to die of colon cancer. Like, no, no, no. You like think you have to, you have to dig down that extra level and say like, well, what exactly did this study find? You know, like, do you, did it find that like people who had this variant had, you know, a slightly higher risk of this disease? Yeah. And also like, how big was the study? Like if, if a lot of these studies, when they're preliminary, it's just like a hundred people. They're tiny and, uh, you know, tiny studies are often wrong. And so there are plenty of ver- mutations that were thought originally to cause diseases that we now know do not. So, um, you know, you got to think about all these things when you're looking at these results. And that's kind of gets back to me and my uh, how, how I feel that like our, our, our high school, grade school genetics has just got to step up its game because, these things are not just abstractions that you learn about in high school and never think about again. People are getting these results in, in their email inbox. Right. But also, isn't it, isn't it maybe an antiquated kind of worry? Because, um, I, well, recently I bought new running shoes. So I went to the Nike website and they let you actually uh, <clears throat> customize your own shoes. Like, you know, what color is the <laughs> front and what, you know, what logo is on the bottom and stuff like that. So within a couple of generations, we'll have a website for doing that for our babies, right? We'll just be able to pick what uh, different features we want them to have, edit the DNA and get whatever baby we want. Uh, I, I am sure that there will pe- be people who are offering that if, if the laws <laughs> allow. You know, I don't think that you will get the baby that, of your dreams. I think your baby will will just be your baby, and <laughs> and will be subject to all the vagaries of of experience and biology and all the rest of it. Um, but you know, we already have all sorts of um, companies out there that are offering really dubious uh, claims uh, based on looking at your DNA, you know, they'll look at a few variants and they'll say, aha, like, here's your special, you know, um, exercise program, or, or here's your, here's your special DNA diet, or, or just, <laughs> th- there's even a company that um, called Vinome. I don't know if you've seen them. No, they will recommend wine to you based on your DNA. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, sorry. How do you spell that? I actually have to do to look this up. What is this? Yeah, called? yeah, yeah. Please do. V I N O M E. Vino. All right. Could be a podcast sponsor down the road. <laughs> I like it. Um, well, yeah. Uh, you may you may not want to play this episode because I mean, <laughs> when I saw a video for it, I just thought, well, this is is this wait is this the onion? I, I, I'm I, this this can't be real. Um, but it was, uh, and. You know, like, I mean, all all these companies seem to be doing, as far as I can tell, is, um, you know, looking in the scientific literature and saying like, you know, oh, do you know, here's a variant where people who had it tended to report a stronger sensation for bitter tastes than people who didn't. Right. And then going from that to saying like, here, take this Pinot Noir, um, and, and, um, you know, with exercise, it's it's a very similar thing. I mean, yeah, sure, there are genes that are ex- associated with all sorts of aspects of exercise. You know, the power in your muscles or how much oxygen you take in and so on. And I'm sure that, like, there is a genetic element to great athletes being great. But, you know, I when I got my genome sequenced, uh, the company that gave me that first sort of uh, first layer of, of results before I took matters into my own hand, they actually like said like, your muscles are built for power. And I was like, <laughs> sorry, I do not mean to laugh. I was laughing at something completely separate that was happening here yeah, in the room. I'm sure. I'm sure. No, it's okay, Sean. Yeah, like, I mean, <laughs> you, you've met me and, and I, I mean, like anybody who has met me knows that my muscles are not built for power. I mean, that's just not the case. Uh, and, you know, but what they were doing is they were just looking at this one variant and these, these limited number of studies and not taking into account all the other genes that influence our muscles, many of which we don't really understand. So, yeah, there's, uh, I, 
so I do worry about, uh, you know, letting letting folks like that who make who run these companies do the same thing with with, uh, you know, designing babies. Well, tell us a little bit, though, about CRISPR and the reality of gene editing. It is something that uh, is is rushing at us very, very quickly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I only became aware of CRISPR maybe six years ago or something. And, and uh, I can remember thinking, I mean, at first I was sort of puzzled by it because actually CRISPR w- was, uh, it's, a, it's a natural thing. What it is, is it's basically an immune system for bacteria. They mm-hmm. make molecules that, that can essentially um, store information about viruses and then use that information to create new molecules that could zero in on particular stretches of virus DNA and cut it. And I thought, wow, that's, that's cool. I mean, microbes never cease to amaze me, <clears throat> but, um, but then some scientists said, Hmm, well, we could use that. Um, and we could maybe cut whatever DNA we want. And lo and behold, they could, they could zero in on particular stretches of DNA and make cuts and then substitute in new DNA. And, uh, all of a sudden, they had this very powerful new uh, molecular tool at their disposal. Um, you know, scientists use CRISPR all the time now to do experiments. You know, they might say, like, we want to know, you know, which cell, I'm, I'm sorry, we want to know, you know, which genes in a cancer cell are essential for it to survive as a cancer cell. So they would just use CRISPR to systematically cut out every single gene in individual cell lines and just see which ones survive as, as cancer. You just mm-hmm. couldn't do that before. I mean, yeah. so the impact is unbelievable. Um, and then people are starting to say like, well, can we use this to uh, alter the genes of crops or of animals? And the answer is hell yeah. Sure. Uh, <laughs> and so, so the next step is, well, what can we do for people? And one of the things you can potentially do for people is um, treat hereditary diseases. So if someone has sickle cell anemia, you take some of their um, their bone marrow st- cells out, these stem cells that can make blood. You tweak their DNA so that they can now uh, make hemoglobin um, that they need, you know, the proper kind of hemoglobin, because sickle cell anemia is caused by a misshapen kind of hemoglobin. And uh, you put the cells back into people and they make healthy blood cells. Um, that's, that's the hope. Um, and there are clinical trials that could start very soon on that. Um, and then the, the big frontier, the one that, that, you know, understandably everybody gets excited and scared about is what if you could use these on embryos and change genes in embryos and then you are creating an inherited change that will be passed down through the generations. Right. Yeah. Nice. They're going to do it. Right. It's going to, I mean, so, <laughs> so uh, you know, I, I have a kind of an extremist point of view on this because uh, people say people raise this question that you just raised, you know, can we uh, genetically edit what's going on in an embryo and therefore change what the person is going to be like? And there's a sort of instant reluctance, right? It's it's like, well, of course, that would be bad, or at least it might be bad. We should think about it and we should you know, really be very careful. But I'm not quite sure where the reluctance comes from other than a sort of squickiness, right? A sort of feeling that we're messing with nature. And uh, what I suspect is that some people will feel that way. Some people will not feel that way. And it's absolutely 100% going to happen. And 100 years from now, the idea of just making a baby uh, by randomly picking half of the DNA from mom and half the DNA from dad and hoping for the best will seem hopelessly barbaric. (laughs) Uh, Well, you know, you and I are going to have to, you know, hope that... uh you know, life extension, anti-aging drugs uh, advance really f- quickly <laughs> so that we can make a bet and see if it pans out, you know. Yeah. Uh, but, um, you know, I, I have thought about these scenarios a lot. Um, partly they're just fun to think about. And, and it's, um, and, and, you know, it's, it's, it's what science fiction writers do so well. 
and um, you know, I, I there are a lot of questions I have. I mean, I don't, I, uh, I, I'm not as sanguine, maybe is the word, as you are. Like in the sense that, um, so for starters, like CRISPR, like uh, CRISPR is is indeed revolutionary, but um, it, it it's turning out to to have some some problems um it, it because it's it's ba- it's it, people call it gene editing but it's editing that involves chopping dna and that right. is a pretty radical thing to do to dna uh, and cells don't like it i mean we the cells actually have all sorts of defenses against chopping up dna because it can lead to all sorts of damage that can ultimately uh cause a cell's descendants to become cancerous, for example. Um, and uh, not only, so, you know, there, there are concerns about um, just how safe uh, CRISPR would be in terms of like creating a line of cells you'd want to put in your body through CRISPR. Like you don't want to put in cells that are going to be more prone to cancer. That's problem right. number one. Problem number two, there's a recent study um, that uh, showed that Sometimes when um, scientists try to cut one particular segment of DNA out, they <clears throat> cut out a long stretch that includes that that particular target. Um, and so you might be cutting out pieces of DNA that you really need. Uh, and <clears throat> maybe maybe that when the DNA is getting repaired, it gets kind of shuffled around in, in ways that could be a problem. So, so okay, so there's the safety issue and then... Um, then also there's kind of like the logistics issue, you know, like, you know, if you're saying, I mean, you know, you're saying like, oh, this is barbaric. So you're imagining a world where, are you imagining a world where all say 9 billion people um, all get in vitro fertilization? You know, I mean, in vitro fertilization is a very uh, difficult drawn out process right now. Um, Mm -hmm. It could get a lot better in the future, but, you know, maybe not. Maybe there are some inherent sort of limits to to this. Um, it, it's not. So my point is like, Chris, it wouldn't be Chris. You wouldn't have CRISPR alone would not deliver you into that science fiction future. You'd have to have all sorts of other advances in reproductive technology and stem cell research and all the rest of it um, before this could even be possible. But I, yeah, but I, I, but I, I have talked to biologists who say, you know, we're going to look at we're going to we're going to um look at crispr like vaccination in the future right yeah so i i think uh, I, I get absolutely the fact that it's not the, within the next five years or 10 years, right? We will have to extend our lives if we're going to see this thing come true. And, and I'm, I'm also not sanguine in the sense that I think that it's an un, going to be an unalloyed good. I look at, you know, this editing of our children's genomes as some, it's a technology. It's like cars or Twitter, right? There's going to be good parts about it or bad parts about it. I just think it's inevitable. I just think that it's it's like we have uh, jumped off of a pier into the ocean. And as we fall in, we're debating, should we get wet or not? And uh, that's just not a debate that is very reasonable to have. We can have other debates. Should we swim for shore? Should we try to climb back up the pier? Should we fight off the sharks? But I think it's going to happen. And, you know, people are going to be trying to alter their children's intelligence and skin color and size of their noses and everything. And I think that we're kind of dropping the ball a little bit on dealing with what the implications of that really are going to be. Well, I mean, I guess the question becomes, you know, if people um, really are going to try to do this, if they can, that, you know, should we um, pass laws to prevent that? Um, or, or do we have do we put regulations in place to to allow certain uses of it for certain things, uh, and then and then really you shifting from a scientific question to a social or or a political one, you know for example with we're dealing with that right now actually I mean people don't realize it but you know gen- genetically engineering humans has already begun um, because um, you know some. We were talking about mitochondria before, like so. So, mutations can cause mitochondria to become defective, and so 
women can pass down uh, defective mitochondria to their children and you can get these mitochondrial diseases, which can be quite devastating. And there are all sorts of different ones that emerge from, from faulty mitochondria. So um, some years ago, people thought, well, what if we were to do a, a transplant, an egg transplant, take the, the DNA in the nucleus of an egg and put it into a donor egg that has good mitochondria in it? Obviously, you take out the nuclear DNA out of the egg, donor right. egg first. But anyway, so, so basically, you're just get, now you have an egg that has the mother's nuclear DNA, the chromosomes, and another woman's mitochondria and then fertilize that. Uh, people call that three parent babies, <laughs> which is unfortunate, <laughs> but it's stuck. Anyway, well, yeah, yeah. Eh, well, we can debate about what it means to be a parent, uh, but yeah. But in any case, um, you know, uh, in the United States, um, that has been banned. I mean, you, you that, there's no there's no way that's going to happen in the United States. There's no way there's going to be research or evaluation of it. Forget it. That's that is dead in the water right now. Um, uh, and uh, you know there was a case of a new, of a doctor in New York who had done some research on this, who actually went to Mexico to treat um, a, a couple um, who the mother had a mitochondrial disease, and so they um, Mexico doesn't have any laws one way or the other about it, and so they did it kind of on the you know secretly um and uh but meanwhile in britain they talked about this they uh, very quite explicitly they had discussions in parliament and they said you know what um these diseases are so devastating and um we we feel that you know this combination of mitochondria from one woman and chromosomes from another woman we're okay with that. You know, we don't think that violates sort of human dignity and um, we're going to allow this to go forward under a lot of regulation. And so there's a university uh, in Britain that has gotten a license. They're open for business. And so they will start, probably babies will start be bo being born soon through this technology. So, you know, I wonder like what's going to happen with CRISPR? Um, right. Will it be will it be the American version total ban? Will it be the Mexico version? Like it's all kind of on a you know unregulated black market, or is it going to be out in the open, carefully, explicitly regulated, you know, uh, and uh, under the guidance of government? Well, and I think that's I'm being a little intentionally provocative here because I think that people are there's a tendency for people either to just sort of ask rhetorical questions and leave them hanging without quite yeah. answering them. Or there's this other tendency, which we in the United States love so much, is just to ban it first and ask questions later. For something like d designer babies, if it does become uh, possible, and uh, obviously there's enormous scientific technical hurdle hurdles to getting there, but, you know, I could easily imagine that it's banned here. And so, OK, so someone sets up a clinic in uh, Mexico or the Cayman Islands or whatever, and rich people go there and design their babies and poor people can't do it. Or even if it doesn't get banned anywhere, like you alluded to earlier, there's just, OK, you can do it. It costs a million dollars, right? That's just how much the, the effort is going to require. And so that's a kind of inequality socially that uh, is is going to be hard to deal with. It's a little bit, it hits uh, home in a way, you know, the ability to make sure all your children are, you know, tall and beautiful that uh, other kinds of inequality might not. I, I have a problem with the, these arguments against CRISPR based on inequality because mm -hmm. they all make it sound like we are living in an, in a paradise of equality today. Um, you know, wait, it, what we're not, <laughs> you know, like it, you're, you know, if you're, if you are con concerned about inequality, like, like it's time to get started now. Um, because it's not as if, uh, genes are the only thing that can influence the, the success of, of children later in life. Uh, and, and sure. so, you know, and, you know, and this, this raises, I, I do think that this also raises difficult questions because, you know, if you say, okay, well, it's wrong to let parents uh, use CRISPR to make their children, let's say, you know, tall and beautiful or whatever you want to dream that you could do with CRISPR. Uh, I, I don't think that would happen, but let's just pretend you could do mm -hmm. that. Anyway. Um, okay. 
Um, so what about all the other uh, uh, advantages that children of wealthy parents have that 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 uh, help them to get ahead in life? You know, sh- sh- do, do we make those illegal? Um, should uh, SAT prep classes be banned? Yeah, no, I think this is very real, but I, I still think the analogy is not quite perfect. I mean, I get it, and I, I think that we are a terrible <laughs> society at, uh, at at treating people equally right now. That, that that point is very, very well taken. But in America, at least, you know, people grow up with this idea that someday, no matter where you come from, you could be a millionaire, you could be president. But no one grows up with the idea that, uh, you know, 20 years from now, my DNA will be better. So there's a, it's a it's this kind of obvious in your face uh, difference between people, which I suspect people will react to very viscerally. I, I I agree, and I mean I think part of it is that well you know part of the problem here is that we think of genes as being the sort of uh, absolute definition of who we are. It's not, yeah. um, but um, but we also think about heredity in, in the sense that like um, these kids will then pass down these traits to their kids and so on. And, uh, and that really like strikes a chord, I think, because like I was saying before, like her- heredity is, is such a profound um, thing to us in terms of how we define ourselves. Um, and so to be tampering with heredity seems like one of the great uh, 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 transgressions. Um, and, yeah. and, and, and that I think colors our, our, our discussion of this. And you can see this and, you know, in the de- debates, debates people have, you know, scientists, uh, who developed CRISPR actually have just in the past few years, like had a series of I- international meetings to, to figure out like, well, what, what, what's right, what's wrong, what should we do with, with this? And the overriding issue, it seemed was, what is this going to do to heredity? Mm-hmm. Uh, which is so striking to me um, because it really tells you where our concerns are are located, um, and um, I think it's a good question. But um, you know, on, on the other hand, I mean, I just I don't. Some people say like, oh, we're going to turn ourselves into two separate species. You know, you'll have the rich people <laughs> who can afford CRISPR who will become their own species in the poor people will become a different species. And so it reminds me of, uh, you know, the time it's machine. It's very HG Wells. Yes, yeah, exactly. Right. That's right. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. But, but you, know, you know, like, but, but people, but like that just, people just don't work that way. Like animals in general don't work that way. Like you, you, like people have sex, lots of sex. And like people don't respect these sort of arbitrary boundaries when they're having sex. Yeah. Like, Whatever genes get might get introduced into some rich person will either disappear entirely from the human gene pool eventually, because that's what happens to most gene variants, or will just kind of diffuse around all over the world after a while because of just the way that people have kids together. So, um, so you know, I just find some of these science fiction scenarios. Um, that people are talking about as if they're like real ethical questions to be silly, frankly. <laughs> I think actually, so I'm going to, I'm going to go on the other side. I think that uh, even if they're wildly unrealistic and not mapping out the future, I'm glad people are envisioning the craziest, most extreme scenarios. I think it will help us sort of be prepared a little bit for uh, the brave new world yet to come. Well, but, but no, but, but, <laughs> but, but you have to then, but <laughs> Okay, you, we can talk about these scenarios, but then we have to take the next step and say, like, well, okay, but here's the basic, here are the basic facts of science that tell you that this is not even something worth considering. You know, sure. um, you know, like for example, like I I wrote an article for the Times recently about studies on DNA uh, and the and the link between genes and how long you stay in school. There is a connection there. We don't really know why there's a connection there. It may, it may have to do with genes that influence certain things in our brains or maybe even our parents' brains. We don't know. But there's an association there. It's interesting. It's worth studying. Um, and you can actually like look at you know these million variants uh, in people's DNA and actually come up with a score 
a sort of education score, which which sounds very fancy, like, mm. oh, well, I could use that to, you know, test some kindergartner and say, like, ah, you're never going to make it to college. So we're just going to put you over here in this this track and, you know, you just be content with your lot. And that would be a ridiculous thing to do because this score you know, it only predicts a small amount of the variation in how people do in school. So chances are that your score would be very wrong. Um, so, you know, lots of people with, with a high genetic score who drop out early from school, there are a lot of people with a low genetic score who go into grad school. Like it's, it's just one variable among several. So, you know, for people to say like, oh, okay, well, clearly we're going to have this future where every, everybody's fate is predetermined. Well, no, no. And it's, <laughs> it's, it's not a scenario worth talking about just because of the basic statistics of what we're talking about. So, yeah. you know, I'm all for talking about scenarios, but you have to, you have to be willing to, to throw some out. No, I, I completely agree on that. I mean, that, that idea that you just said about sort of predicting people's educational attainments on the basis of their DNA makes uh, you know, no sense to me. It's like taking a preseason power poll in some sports league and then saying, well, we don't need to play the games now. We figured out who's going to win. But playing the games actually matters also. So uh, Carl Zimmer, or as we say around here, Carl built for power Zimmer. Thank you very <laughs> much for uh, a wonderful conversation. It's always great to talk to you. Oh, it's good talking to you again, Sean. All right. Bye-bye. Bye.